Well, welcome to our, uh, to our webinar. Uh, my name's Steve Hanrahan. I'm the Advocacy Manager for TIA and facilitator for today's webinar. Today's theme is Alert Level 3, Where To From Here? And we've invited three uh, Chris Roberts, Chief Executive of TIA, and Chris will talk about areas that TIA is currently advocating on. Um, Gaynor Parkin, Chief Executive of Umbrella, will talk about managing our mental health as the crisis continues. And we will talk to Les Morgan, Chief Operating Officer for Sedema Hotels. Sedema were the winner of the Supreme Tourism Award at the 2019, last year's New Zealand Tourism Awards. We'll talk to Les about how a large organisation such as Sedema Hotels has and is responding to the crisis. So following these uh, five minute introductions from the panelists, we'll have a Q&A session with attendees. So you're probably very familiar with webinars now. So please note the, the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and send your questions through. The webinar is scheduled for 30 minutes. However, it may run uh, up to another 15 minutes longer if there is Q&A to get through. And we'll finish by 2.45. So Chris, over to you. Kia ora Steve, thank you. Um, I guess just to paint a picture, the current priorities for TIA at the moment are advocacy, uh, business support and connection and communications. Uh, we also need to be actively involved in the tourism recovery planning uh, and encouraging all of the stakeholders in our industry to remain committed to the long-term sustainability goals that we have for the industry. In, in terms of the tourism recovery uh, that, we're, that we're turning our mind to, uh, it really should be presumed, I think it's, it's best for us all to presume that there will be no return of international visitors in 2020. Uh, any that we do get would be a bonus. Uh, and a return to anything like the previous level of international tourism could take three to five years. So the tourism recovery will be local first, then regional, then national, uh, before borders start to open up. But of course, brand awareness must be maintained in those international markets and New Zealand should respond quickly to any opportunities that, that arise to facilitate a safe international travel. So uh, that's why we're encouraging the New Zealand and Australian governments to be planning now for a trans-Tasman bubble. If both countries maintain our current uh, apparent success in containing the spread of, of the COVID-19 virus within our own borders, there is the opportunity to open up the Tasman, and that would be a major boost, of course. It would require all of the systems to be in place to deal with COVID-19 risks and public acceptance that such a reopening was safe and possible. Um, discussions have already begun on getting the key reps from each country involved, that's the tourism and aviation sectors, uh, the respective border agencies, uh, to look at what it would take to create a trans-Tasman bubble, and whether we could also safely include the Pacific uh, our Pacific neighbours are hugely reliant on their links with New Zealand and Australia. But as I said, New Zealand must also be prepared to open its borders as soon as it can to other countries uh, when they have the virus under control and when they can demonstrate that they can facilitate safe travel. We certainly also uh, support Tourism New Zealand's new mandate to take a lead role in domestic uh, tourism promotion. Um, which will be, need to, of course, be coordinated with regional tourism bodies and with tourism businesses. This crisis has also reinforced the need for our industry to have more data, in particular real-time and near real-time data, and um, has really highlighted the gap that we have uh, in domestic tourism data. So we're doing some work around that. Uh, the government, um, we've also asked the government uh, to calculate and share with the industry some forecast for the tourism recovery. That's really important for tourism businesses and discussions with banks and other, and, and other stakeholders um, to have some, some maybe forecast scenarios rather, rather than just one forecast, but what would the government see uh, the recovery of tourism looking like over say the next one to five years uh, and the economic contribution that it can make. The tourism industry is of course people and infrastructure rich, so we need uh, innovative ways to utilize these resources as we, as we emerge from this so that they're not lost to us. There are quite a number of discussions happening that are very innovative and we, we're involved in a number of those and we encourage those um, discussions going forward to uh, 
retain both our people and our assets um, for, for uh, when we're the best place to use them again. Um, thinking about that, that future TIA in the industry, um, I, I think I'm sure we're all very keen and ready to be closely involved in the Tourism New Zealand, uh, their other project, their second project to reimagine tourism. I understand that the, a paper was going to the Minister of Tourism uh, yesterday or today uh, with the Tourism New Zealand's initial thinking on that. Um, it's really, really important that everyone has a say in that. Uh, any reimagining, any reemergence of tourism will fail uh, without very strong private sector involvement. And I know that we've received lots of ideas and lots of people volunteering to be involved. And Tourism New Zealand has received literally hundreds uh, of such approaches. So we know the industry is very keen to be involved um, in the reimagining. Um, really, on, on terms of, of the alert levels and what alert level three might mean for the industry, I think both, most of you would be aware it doesn't mean a, a much change from alert level four for, for most of us. Uh, we've worked quite closely on uh, updating the level for accommodation guidelines for level three, and there are some subtle changes there. But for, for most customer-facing tourism businesses, level three means you still can't have an interface directly with your customer. Um, so we're turning our, mark, uh, our mind quite quickly to, to alert level two uh, and then alert level one and what might be uh, achievable under those alert levels. And we'd like to, we'll be pushing for some greater clarity and flexibility for level two, which at the moment is only um, captured in a few short lines and would appear to be quite restrictive to the idea of domestic travel. Um, so we'd, we'll try to unpick that a little and see if we can get some movement on that. Um, Look, like all businesses, tourism businesses need clear guidance um, on what might be required under each alert level um, and then access to quick answers on what they need to do to be able to operate their, their business correctly. That's probably enough for uh, introductory comments uh, from me. Um, we're also doing, um, you know, promoting a whole lot of other things that we'd like to see done to support the tourism industry and, and, ha and happy to um, expand on those in the question time. Kia ora. Thanks, Chris. Um, Gaina, um, over to you. Thank you, and lovely to be be here um, with you all. So my my spot is to talk with you a bit about how do we protect and boost um, our well-being uh, during level four, three, two, whichever level we're at. And as everyone's saying, um, those of you directly impacted are in one of the sectors that's been been hit the hardest um, and and do do really feel for you um, and I know many of you will be attending this webinar to think about um, your, yourselves um, but also many of you I know are working very hard to support your staff and to keep your staff um, going through these um, levels so when I was thinking about what's going to be most useful I've just put together a few um, kind of key points on what we know from best practice psychological research uh, in terms of what helps us to protect our well-being. And a good place to go um, if you're wanting more information after the webinar is um, the Mental Health Foundation's um, website, which has some good resources. And also TIA have done a, a great job of putting some resources up as well. So I'm just going to quickly uh, share my screen with you now. Can everyone see that okay? You can see it okay? Uh, not yet. Well, you can't. Okay, I'll just do another little screen share. I did it before and it worked, didn't it? <laughs> and now it's not. It the way. Uh, one, one minute, everybody. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I can try that again. Is that working now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, perfect. So thinking about how some many of you might be feeling at the moment, it's really important to know that most of us will have an um, anxiety, worry response to what's happening. So some of you may notice that you're feeling more irritable or helpless or sad. Some of you might notice you're doing things like finding it harder to sleep, perhaps drinking more, feeling a bit less motivated than normal. It's really normal to be feeling overwhelmed, um, to find it hard to make um, decisions at the moment. Um, 
getting some of those sort of heart palpitations or feeling a bit breathless and and noticing that it's really hard to kind of hold hold the big, big picture getting stuck in the detail so what what's really important to know is those um, those experiences, those symptoms are how our brains and our bodies react when we're under pressure and under stress, particularly when we don't know when the pressure or the stress have a clear end point. Um, so really important to know that if you're feeling any of these or you notice that your staff are displaying some of these signs, the good news is it doesn't mean that we're going going mad. Um, it means you're not alone. Many of us will be feeling like this at the moment. And it's a very normal um, way for us to feel as, as human beings when things are uncertain. I want to share this model with you called Te Whare Tapafa, which is a fantastic um, model of um, mental health. Um, Mason Jury developed it as a model of Māori well-being. It's hugely relevant for um, all of us in New Zealand. And what this model says is when we're thinking about boosting or protecting our mental health or our well-being, particularly during times of uncertainty, it's important that we pay attention to these um, four pillars. So thinking about our physical well-being, our spiritual health or what's meaning to us in our lives, thinking about our, um, our bubble, our, our family or the people that we're living with, and also thinking about our mental health. And this, this model is also on the Mental Health Foundation website. So do have a, another longer look at it. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the things that can boost um, um, our mental health at this time. One of the things that we know is really, really important is when we're under stress and when that stress is, is ongoing and uncertain, it's really important that we pause and stop and give ourselves extra recovery time. So even though you might be thinking, well, I'm not doing very much at the moment, you know, I'm not running my hotel or I'm not interacting with, with customers or tourists, it's really important to know that your brain is still working hard. So scheduling and planning times of recovery are really important. And recovery can be physical recovery, so going out for a walk um, or a bike ride in our neighbourhood or maybe getting out in the garden would be an example of that. Some um, mental recovery, so making sure you're having time away from work, off screens, maybe doing something like reading a book or a um, crossword puzzle, puzzle or anything that's going to help your brain to wind down. That kind of purpose and meaning in recovery, so thinking about um, what might be really important to you um, outside of, of work and connecting in with that. So really important to think about how do we put times of pause and recovery in our day and in our week. And generally the rule of thumb would be the more stress we're under, the more recovery we, we want. Something else that we can know that can be really helpful, and I think in, in your industry this is particularly relevant at the moment, is to focus our attention on the what we can control and influence at the moment and to try and take our attention away from things that we can't um, control or influence. So what that might mean is going, okay, I can't, um, I can't influence the worldwide um, response to what's happening at the moment where I can put my control and influence is possibly what's happening in my bubble, perhaps my family, perhaps my community, maybe colleagues that you have um, in the tour tourism industry that you can connect with. So it's very much trying to give us that idea of keeping our attention where, where it's helpful, where it's useful, and, and letting go of, of what I can't. Uh, that's, this model is um, from someone called Stephen Covey, and you can, again, look it up if it's useful. And something else that we also know really important is that being able to validate and give ourselves permission to feel how we're feeling right now. And most of us are really good at doing that for other people. So, for example, if Liz said to me, or Chris or Steve said to me, hey, this is how I'm feeling at the moment, and I feel like I'm not being terribly productive, I'd probably say something supportive back. I'd probably say something like, hey, that's okay. You've got a lot going on. Just try doing one thing at a time and, and take a day at a time. Quite often we can be more critical with ourselves and give ourselves a bit of a harder time. So one of the things that can be helpful to keep in mind is if myself or I see someone struggling with one aspect of that pillar, 
how would I say something that's supportive or encouraging? And, and how would I say that um, to, to myself? So that's more than my five minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to pause now and, and let the others continue, but happy to answer some, some questions when we get to them. Great. Thank, thank you, Gaynor. Um, please, I might, I've got a couple of questions for you that perhaps we could start a conversation um, with. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can. And kia ora. Um, so how does a large organisation like Sedema approach crises management with COVID? Uh, there's the communications, the decision making. How have you approached it? Uh, well, like all businesses, um, you know, it's been very reactive to start with. And, um, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say that there have been moments of, uh, you know, real deep thought and crisis. Uh, but one thing we were determined to do right from the outset is communicate, uh, communicate as clearly as we possibly could with our team members. From the very early stages, we uh, were very, um, very upfront about the potential impact uh, on people's jobs. And, uh, you know, we addressed directly the uncertainty. So for us, clear com communication was the, was the key. And um, we were very frank, uh, Steve, and um, I know that that was initially very difficult for the team to take, but my opinion was that we're better off to pass on all the information, um, give people a big picture look, uh, and then it's actually subsequently helped because as the waves of bad news came through, um, I don't think um, you know it, uh, it became too much of a shock. So that was the key thing, and that's still a key thing, I think, is the, is the key. The communication. The second thing really um, is that we do have some operating hotels and those are managed isolation facilities. So our priority really is the care and health and safety of those employees. I'm actually based in one of those hotels today. We Hotel managers had to take special leave. So I've walked in today and following the guidelines of uh, the Ministry of Health and it's quite confronting. Uh, there are police, uh, army, AVSEC, Ministry of Health people on site. Um, all our staff are dressed in PPE gear. And the hotel currently uh, looks like a hospital. So um, it reinforced for me today the, the point that um, we've got concern for our employees. Um, and we're just making sure that they're following very, very strict guidelines. Um, I guess the... the the next thing was the care for the teams that aren't directly involved. Um, the care for people that are sitting at home, um, I guess, kind of waiting on the sidelines. You know, what are we doing for them? So we have um, got a roster amongst the executive team and the talent and culture teams where we're speaking to employees um, all the time. We're texting with them, checking in. And, um, you know, I really enjoy Gaynor's presentation because some of the feedback we're getting from our team members are that they are anxious, mm. that they are under stress. Um, so we just think that that communication is really, really important. Uh, we've issued um, care packages in many cases, and we're just trying to uh, uh, do our best to remain in contact and offer them support. And then I guess the next thing we're doing, of course, like all tourism businesses, is focusing on our restructure. You know, how is that going to look? Um, preparing the business for the, the battle that lies ahead. Um, and then somewhat turning our attention now to the future. You know, what's that going to look like? And um, of course, there's a great deal of uncertainty. Um, but, um, you know, a, a part of the business is focused on that. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're listening and trying to get as much information as we can to see, um, you know, how the next few months and, uh, and years are going to look. Right. Thanks, Les. I think you covered off a couple of my other questions there, but I think, um, you know, really at this stage, are there any positives at all for this for you or Sedema from the crisis? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm desperately trying to find some. Um, I guess we're learning a lot and, you know, we have a lot of young people working for us, like uh, I'm sure all other tourism businesses and they haven't been through these crises before. Um, so they're getting, 
um, you know, first-hand experience of how to deal with these things. They're learning quickly. They're having to, to think on their feet. Um, so, you know, I guess there's some positives in that we're gathering a lot of experience. Um, and we're certainly seeing, um, you know, the strong people shine through. So they're, they're being, um, you know, put through um, the furnace uh, in the nicest way. And, um, you know, you know, very, um, very pleased to, to see the level of commitment from our team in terms of you know voluntary pay cuts or voluntary leave and things like that, and that's been very touching and emotional. Um, so I, I think it's brought everyone together. There's no question about that. Great, thanks, Liz, and thanks for the to the panel for those introductory comments. Um, we'll head over into uh, Q and A now. Uh, so a reminder to attendees: please send your uh, questions through. Um, Chris, this one might be uh, for you about, has there been anything definitive announced by QLDC regarding the bed tax in Queenstown? Um, is it fair to presume this matter is bed now? Sorry, I'll just unmute myself. Yes, there has been um, announcement. Um, it is off the table for now. Um, so it's not currently being pursued. Uh, the, the mayor hasn't ruled out returning it, uh, returning to it at some future date. But I think if it is returned to, uh, it'll be we're talking some years away, not um, any any time soon. So uh, no, the, the previous the work on that has stopped, um, and there is no current plans to have a bed tax in Queenstown or uh, anywhere else. And of course, um, many will be aware that the the targeted rate in Auckland, which is not a bed tax, but a rate, um, has been suspended uh, or will be suspended for 12 months. Um, so that's some relief to accommodation providers in Auckland. Uh, Chris, possibly another one for you. Is Taiwan in the lens for early international travellers uh, we will look at, given the low numbers of cases? I think there are a number of, of countries that have potential. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of talk about Australia because of the close relationship and the similar tracks we're on and, and how well we know each other's country. But uh, around the, uh, the Asian um, area, there are a number, a number of other countries that are doing pretty well. Taiwan is, is certainly among them. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore was doing very well, but seems to have a um, bit of an escalation happening now. So yes, there are other countries, and I think we need to be, um, as I said in my opening comments, open to the prospect of um, having an open border with selected co countries if, if they um, have the virus under control and we can have some guarantees that we are receiving safe travellers uh, from those countries. So yeah, Taiwan would definitely be uh, on that list. Great. Uh, Chris, probably another one for you. Um, for places like Queenstown, Rotorua, for example, which is so totally reliant on tourism, there's an urgent need to have some additional government support. The way the subsidy has helped, but it would need to be for twice as long, if not three times as long, if operators are to survive in these areas. So do you believe central government has a true understanding of what's needed here for these specific areas? And what's your sense on whether they are willing to support this further? I think they do have a good understanding, but we're, we're certainly um, barking at their heels constantly to make sure that they do understand uh, the impact on tourism businesses, um, not just in places like Queenstown and Rotorua, but um, obviously those are a couple of locations um, that are particularly reliant on tourism. Um, we have been pushing very strongly for the government to make an early announcement on what happens at the end of the 12 week wage subsidy period. We know businesses need uh, for their planning purposes to know that as soon as possible. I'm hopeful there'll be an announcement by next week. Um, so will, will the wage subsidy be extended? Will it be become more targeted? Will it be replaced by something else? Um, I think there will be something. Um, what it's going to be, we don't know yet. Uh, and and there, is, you know, there is a case there for it to be more targeted. Um, we've probably all read the stories in the media of, of the sort of businesses uh, that have received some of the nine billion dollars to date uh, and we know the tourism businesses desperately need that money some of the other businesses getting money um, we may all have our 
our own individual questions over whether they uh, need it quite so much. So, the, so there may um, be a, a good argument for more targeted assistance. So we, we wait to see that government announcement, but we they're they're very they're being told very clearly they need to make that announcement as soon as possible. Uh, this next question, possibly for Gaynor and Liz, how should how should CEOs and general managers ensure a duty of care of their staff during this time, particularly in response to arguments and types of bullying? Do you have any mm. advice? It's a, good, it's a good question. My immediate thoughts would be, you know, as we were just saying, everyone is under pressure and most of us show our less desirable uh, personality traits and habits when we're under stress. So I think ideally anyone who's in any sort of leadership role will show extra, Liz was saying that, extra care, compassion, patience, understanding, try and give people more of a bandwidth than, than we normally would because everyone is finding this really hard. I think our, however, having said that, our usual duty of care under our Health and Safety Act is to continue to protect people's physical, mental, emotional well-being. And that means if we do see um, behaviour that's not okay, we need to call it out and, and manage it well, just, just as we normally would. But I think more of a bandwidth and gentle conversations, um, knowing that people are under pressure f first, but then definitely calling it out if it's, if it's not okay. Liz, what would you add? Oh, no, I completely agree. I think you've got a future as a CEO. Um, <laughs> uh, you, 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 you definitely have to show um, potentially more compassion and patience than you, than you may have previously. Mm. Um, but equally, there are, there, there are lines that can't be crossed. So, you know, things need to be black and white. Um, but I, I think, you know, with um, having open discussions and um, being tolerant of those things, they are unusual circumstances. And I, I think you need to be doing that. And I guess to answer the question more specifically, you need to be seen to be doing that as a leader. Thank you. Chris, uh, possibly for you, the, the, or the, with the trans-Tasman bubble being talked about as a potential option, have there been any conversations around when this would likely to be happen? Oh, the conversations have started uh, and will ramp up in the next couple of weeks. Um, there are some existing um, uh, groupings uh, that have worked on, on the trans-Tasman border issues in the past when we were looking to open, um, create a common border between Australia and New Zealand. So we know many of the right people um, and have been brought together before um, prior to COVID to discuss these sort of issues. So uh, we're looking to use those existing um, groupings, um, Auckland Airport, um, to give them credit, are sort of leading the charge um, from New Zealand's um, point of view. Um, so I think those conversations will start in the next uh, week or two um, and to try and understand uh, what would be needed. Um, I think the, the Prime Minister called it having um, the smartest border in the world, um, and that and that is probably right. We need technology and other and other checks in place to to, to make it possible. Um, but we could, you know, we certainly have the opportunity to open up a a border there um, if we if both countries stay on the current track of of containing the virus. So, um, yeah, those conversations. address a couple of the earlier questions, which I think I can cover off quite quickly. Um, someone asked about what, what the figures that I base, um, I spent on a three to five year recovery path on. Yeah, th really that's based on previous, um, previous shocks to the system uh, for global tourism, none of which were as severe as this one. Um, for a start, a whole lot of airline, well, airlines aren't flying currently, and a lot of airlines around the world will go bust. And so there was, it's going to take a long time for aviation to ramp up again. Uh, we're going into a significant global uh, recession and possibly a depression, so people won't be traveling as much. Uh, um, ironically, we're all using Zoom and other tools now, and so business travel could actually um, take new patterns and there may not be so much business travel. Um, so I think it's realistic to say that it's, it's, um, it's going to take us three to five years to be... Um, seeing global travel back to a 
a new normal and it won't be what it was before and we don't know quite what it will look like. It doesn't mean we have no international tourism in the meantime. Um, once we have some borders opened, we'll have international tourism immediately once, once the borders allow that. Um, but it will be a long recovery process. It's not, we're not, 2021, we're not going to be back to normal next year. Um, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, and someone asked about participating in reimagining tourism. Um, well, Tourism New Zealand on the Tourism New Zealand corporate website, they have a feedback link there. Um, there's an email address there where you can send through uh, any ideas on that Tourism New Zealand uh, corporate website. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm mindful uh, that we've just clicked over the uh, 2.30 mark. Uh, some attendees may uh, need to uh, go particip participants. So just to let you know, the webinar will be posted um, on TIA's website uh, by this evening if you want to catch up on the rest of it. Um, we'll continue with uh, the questions continuing continuing to come through, so I will continue with those. Les, a couple here for you. Um, Les, what will be your approach during the recovery phase to re-employment? Will you go back to your original staff and look to re-employ them again first? Any thoughts on the growth of the gig economy and use of senior virtual talent, such as virtual CFOs, CMOs? Uh, yes. Uh that's a good question, actually, good wide ranging question. Uh, we're adopting a last off, first on policy. And, and around that policy, we're, we're um, hoping to build a whole toolkit of uh, things we can use to. Uh, so the key thing for us is to remain as connected to them as we can. We are seeing people drift away already, um, especially some of the younger people. Um, and, and in order to get people back or re-engage, yes, we would look to our, obviously, to our current workforce or our previous employees. Um, and we are looking to build more flexibility into um, employment agreements uh, and offer incentives. So I think the whole employment agreement space is going to be different in the future. I won't be surprised to see employees having different demands. Uh, don't be surprised if there are remuneration clauses re-emerging um, around redundancy. So I think that, you know all that will change. Certainly, our employment agreements will look to be um, probably more fixed term, maybe more casual staff, just retaining some flexibility for that. But we'll also look to offer um, uh, signing on bonuses, um, potentially offer extra leave. We also have got to look at our current workforce too and. Uh, you know, we, we're in mind to extend a week's extra annual leave. Um, so a whole lot of things there. I think the gig economy is going to be very, very important. Um, you know, we have had discussions about um, contracting out whole parts of our business in the future. So I think that's a real possibility. Um, you know, for example, housekeeping, um, um, maybe restaurants, um, and certainly in our support office, uh, there might be services there, you know, marketing, sales. Uh, I think we've just got to have an open mind about all those sorts of things. It's not our intention to do those, but it's just prudent of us to go through and review all that. So I guess the simple answer is that, yeah, our businesses will look different and will probably be rebuilt in different ways. Thanks, Liz. Um, another one for you there. With the focus now on planning for what the future will look like and the role of the domestic market and the role the domestic market will play, would your pricing strategy be looked at and how do you see that playing out? Well, it's, there's always a pricing question, isn't there? Uh, one of the things I think hoteliers particularly we've got to be sensitive to is that uh, if the domestic client is struggling and are facing uncertainty, economic uncertainty, they're going to be very price sensitive. So that might um, mean that, you know, camping grounds and motels are the first preference. Um, hotels uh, have a minimum price we must charge. You know, we, 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 yes, we have flexibility, but you know, there is a certain point that it just costs us to um, open the doors in the morning. So yes, we will certainly um, you know, try to deliver as much value as we can, um, but that price will reflect, you know, the level of service and the quality of the, uh, environment you're in so you know there is a limit to what we can do but absolutely we'll try and tailor things and and look to see where we can drive value but 
you know, in, in general, Steve, I'm just urging caution around enthusiasm for the domestic market to come to our rescue. I just think that there are a lot of uncertainties uh, around that market and in particular the leisure domestic market uh, is prominent during the school holidays or public holidays. And I don't know that it's feasible for large hotels in our particular case uh, to remain empty on standby for months on end and then suddenly, you know, open up for weeks. So I just think that we've all got to be very cautious about that. I mean, absolutely, I, I hope I'm wrong about this and the domestic tourism is fantastic, but I, I just take on board Chris's comments. If you're looking at a three to five year recovery, I think we've just got to be cautious. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Chris, uh, one for you. Can we get a confirmed borders closed until period and then revised from there um, to provide some sort of certainty or idea for operators? Uh, that would be nice, but I, I think realistically we're not going to get that um, uh, from the government. Um, it would, I think we, we saw with the uh, announcement on the lifting of level four that we're uh, the intent was to be in level three for two weeks and then renew and then um, review that and decide whether to go to level two. So the government's given a little bit of a hint of, of the way ahead. Um, so we, we may get that when we come out of level three down to level two, there again may be a hint at how long we might be in level two. Um, but the border question will be difficult for them to give us any definite guidance on um, because it, it, it so determined by what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, and we are seeing in some of the countries that um, have done well in getting the virus under control are having a second surge of cases. Um, and the World Health Organization warning that we haven't by any means seen the worst of it yet. Um, so I mean, none of that's um, uh, particularly uh, optimistic um, in terms of what's happening globally. So we can get every, we can get all, uh, do everything we can here within our, our own country to be ready to open those borders, but um, many, of the, many of the decisions will depend on what happens internationally. All right, thanks. Uh, Chris, um, there's been a lot of negativity around international workers in Queenstown where the right support is not being shown to them by some groups on Facebook. Is there any help towards this situation? I wasn't aware that there'd been um, any anti-feeling towards um, the workers in Queenstown, and it's very disappointing if there has been. Um, I have shared Jim Bolt's um, huge disappointment that we're not getting clear answers out of the government in terms of supporting um, uh, overseas workers who have lost their jobs in New Zealand. And it's particularly prevalent in Queenstown, but it's happening in other parts of the country. So. Um, uh, those, those are people on work visas who aren't being supported uh, through the wage subsidy but have lost their jobs um, are now um, without an income. Um, they're running out of their savings. They can't get flights home. Uh, it's almost impossible to get a flight um, out of the country at the moment. Uh, and many are now destitute and relying on, on food banks and handouts um, and people taking them in so that they've actually got a roof over their head. And it, it doesn't feel right. It's not what we should be doing in New Zealand. We've got to show manaki tanga to our visitors, um, especially those that we've invited here to work with us. So um, we're still pushing hard along with, with Queenstown to get some answers out of the government about what's going to be done to help, especially the working visa people who, who um, won't have a job um, and um, just don't have the ability to go home or the, uh, and now the ability to, to um, support themselves while here. Um, it seems the government's almost ignoring that problem at the moment and, and they need to do something about it. Sure. Gaynor, I'm mindful that you have to uh, leave for a 2.45 um, so shortly. Just one for you. Um, is there a hierarchy of things to prioritise when managing mental health for someone? So, for example, is it do you focus on uh, routine and then exercise and then breaks, or is it a balance, finding a balance between all those? Uh, you're on... Um, Unmute myself. Sorry, unmute myself. Yeah, I just said what a what a great question. The sh the quick the quick answer I would say is there's no one right answer, and generally it's experimenting. 
for ourselves and supporting other people to experiment with what works best for them. So some people will find exercise is really helpful. Some people will find routine. Some people will find planning something enjoyable or mixing it up a bit. So, so I think trying different things out is, is the best thing we can do. And if one thing doesn't work, don't get discouraged, try something else. Um, and until you find something that that is useful that that does work and I guess when in doubt ask other people for ideas and support so don't feel like we have to have all the answers ourselves right, I'm, I'm happy to jump on later if there's any particular health well-being questions happy to jump on later and reply as as well if that's useful sure we collate the questions at the end so if there is a couple there we can send them to you send and then them uh, send way. them on yeah. right thanks Kane. Um, and mindful, we're nearing into 2.45, uh, so I made this the last one. Chris, are the, is this one, are several key events lined up for Auckland um, still planned to go ahead at this stage? Any insight on those? And... <laughs> um, look, I think no one wants to cancel major events, especially things, um, the real big things like America's Cup. Um, everyone's just having to keep those things under review. I know for ourselves, we're keeping things like uh, the Tourism Summit and the Tourism Awards under review. Um, and um, we really just have to be quite, um, anyone involved in events just has to be very agile at the moment, have very good planning in place to, to know when you need to exit um, at, at the least um, uh, cost from those events if they're not going to be able to proceed. But um, you know, we there's, there's certainly hope that some of those um, big events um, will still go ahead. I know AT and, and Auckland are doing a, a heck of a lot of work to be able to run the America's Cup um, under different scenarios. So um, we, we know how important events are. Um, and, and, and there's actually some hope. Uh, I know there's been some approaches to run various sporting events um, in New Zealand um, uh, from overseas. So, so uh, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, it might be without a crowd, but if New Zealand's seen as a safe place to bring teams in, we could have all sorts of sports um, being held in empty stadiums. Um, somewhere in New Zealand uh, and then beaming out with, with television rights. So, um, you know, there are some hope for events, um, not the sort of events perhaps we were in, run in the way we might have uh, expected in the past. All right, thanks, Chris. All right, we'll draw it to a close then. Um, firstly, my thanks to our panellists for your sharing of information and your views, much appreciated. And thank you to all our members for participating today in your questions, great to have you online. On the TIA website this evening, and it'll also be in tomorrow's T mail. And also a reminder to visit our COVID 19 pages on the website, on the TIA website. There's lots of current information, advice, and support for operators, and the comm team, comms team are updating that regularly. And lastly, if you have any particular queries, please get in touch with us either via info at tia.org.nz or feel free to give us a call also our phone numbers are on the website contact page so closing kara kia uh, to finish kia to kia tato katoa ti areo ti aroha meite maruto ti he moriora may peace love and safety be upon us all Thanks everyone and have a nice Anzac weekend.